Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. Um, my name is Wan Ji Nganga. I am the Program Manager Access to Finance within Gogla. I'm going to give us a few seconds to get everybody on, on board and get everybody settled before we start. Um, while we're waiting for that, just a few housekeeping issues. One, um, please remember to put your laptop or phone on mute um, to help us have clearer audio for everybody who's going to be speaking. The second thing is if you want to reach out to us, if you have technical issues or questions, please use the chat box on um, on your uh, go to webinar icon. Uh, those will come through to us. We will be happy to respond to them. Um, and then the third thing is a recording of this webinar will be sent to all the participants here. If you do not get this recording or if you want to get this recording and you don't get it, please feel free to reach out to myself or any other of the panelists slash um, Gogla team. I think we can get right into it. So today we're speaking about gender lens investing and the 2x challenge. Like I said, my name is Wan Jinganga. I am the program manager access to finance within Gogla. Um, I have, I'm going to be the moderator for today's webinar. Um, I am going to allow my fellow panelists to introduce themselves before we get started. Welcome. Uh, maybe Anne-Marie, you can start. Hello, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Anne-Marie Lévesque. I am the gender lead at FINDEF Canada, Canada's development finance institution. And I'm also the current chair of the 2X Challenge Working Group. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Go for it. Good, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Arpita Raksit. I'm the gender lead here at CDC Group. We are the UK's development finance institution. Um, I'm a member of the 2X Working Group um, and um, I'm also chair of the Development Finance Institution's Gender Finance Collaborative, um, which is a community of practice across the GFIs to advance the practice of gender smart investing. Thank you for the intro, Arpita. Karen, do you mind giving us an intro as well? I can see your mic is off, thanks. Okay. okay. Yeah, this is Karen Stefishin. Um, I'm the gender advisor for the Power Africa Off-Grid Project based in Pretoria, South Africa. Thanks, Karen. Haley. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Haley. I work as the director of people and culture at Peg Africa. Um, so Peg is a leader in supporting and financing solar to households and SMEs across West Africa, um, and we currently serve hundreds of thousands of daily users across Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, and Mali. Thank you so much, Haley, um, and to each of you panelists for the introduction. Um, before we get started on what is the 2X challenge, what is gender lens investing, I thought I think it's prudent that we start with an introduction of Gogla and why this conversation is important for us to have as a member organization. So Gogla is the global association for the off-grid solar industry. We have to date 160 members drawn primarily from manufacturers of off-grid solar, distributors, investors, and academia in this ecosystem. 
Um, our mission is trying to help our members build sustainable markets, help our members reach profitability um, while delivering quality, affordable off-grid products. We, our members and Lighting Global Associates since 2010 have sold 46 million off-grid solar products. Um, we've actually just released our sales data. If you haven't seen that, I encourage you to have a look at it. And in totality, 280 million people have been impacted by improved access to electricity. So um, that's a little bit about us with regards to Gogla and what we do. Um, personally, as a woman, it's very uh, important to me to have these conversations about gender and how to make sure our work is as inclusive as possible. Being in this space for a few years now, there um, I think there's a lot of disparity with regards to gender in the solar off-grid space, which I would absolutely love to have these conversations to correct that. Um, with regards to Gogla and why investment companies should um, factor the gender aspect in the decision-making process is um, there's a lot that I think can still be done uh, to reach more and more women as, uh, than, we already, than we currently are doing right now. Um, we realize women make up for a little, just about half of the population, particularly in East Africa, but when it comes to purchases of solar home system, they are a quarter of the population. And I think that has some, it has, it has something to say about a lot of the economic empower, empowerment of the women, particularly those in the rural areas. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, um, as Gogla, we've realized that, um, so there are two kinds of households that we've been doing a lot of research on, obviously those that are using solar home systems and those that are not. We, in our research, we uh, those that are using solar home systems are reported to have more economic activity and 49% of these new jobs that have been unlocked um, by having a solar home system are being taken, uh, are being done by women, which for me makes it very encouraging for us in the space. And I think it's something that we should be encouraged by and we should continue to work towards. So in totality, what um, Google is trying to do and what we have at the back of our minds that we're working towards is how to be more thoughtful to include women in the consumption process of solar products, but as well as through different tiers of company leadership um, with all the organizations that we work. That's a little about Gogla and why this is important to us and to our members. I think um, we should now dive into what exactly is the 2X challenge, what exactly we mean by gender lens investing, um, and to get different to get this information, to get different people's uh, different companies opinions on this and why, it, why it's important to them. Um, I will introduce Anne-Marie to take us through um, a few slides that she's put together about the 2X challenge um, and why that's important for her and for Finde. Thank you, Wanji. Um, so I'm very pleased to, to be here today and participate in this webinar talking about the, the 2X challenge. Uh, so for my part, my uh, remarks will focus on, on three things. So first I'll talk about what, what is the 2X challenge and why participating DFIs or development finance institutions have made this commitment. Then I'll move on to the 2x criteria itself, and so digging a bit deeper into how investees can qualify for the challenge. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about what it means to qualify. So what are the DFI expectations or uh, how can investees benefit uh, from inclusion in the 2x challenge? So next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So the 2X Challenge was launched in uh, June 2018, um, and it was a major new commitment that was originally made by the DFIs from the G7 country to mobilize substantial capital in investments that will benefit women. So since then, these DFIs have been supporting investments that provide women in developing countries with access to leadership opportunities, quality forms of employment, finance, access to entrepreneurship and enterprise support, and also products and services that enhance women's economic inclusion and participation. Since the launch in 2018, we have six new members that have joined. Um, so we have now FMO from the Netherlands, Sweat Fund from Sweden, Fin Fund uh, from Finland, IFU from Denmark, CFAM from Switzerland, and uh, now EIB, the European Investment Bank, uh, that are members. So we've really expanded the initiative much beyond the G7. And the participating DFIs have all made this commitment for several reasons. Um, the first is, of course, because there are significant gender gaps that persist in our regions of operation. Women continue to face a lot of constraints when it comes to gaining access to basic services, earning their own livelihoods, starting their own businesses, and basically participating in the economy on an equal footing as men. And so this prevents women from realizing their full potential which hinders both human and economic development. But investing in women and in gender equality also makes sense from a business perspective, as a more gender equal private sector is associated with better business performance and economic growth. So for example, there's mounting evidence that gender diverse boards and senior management teams can lead to better business performance, including higher returns on equity or returns on sales. Adopting gender inclusive policies uh, or gender inclusive measures can also help companies attract and retain talent. Uh, it can help reduce absenteeism, improve productivity, and boost company reputation. And finally, we estimate that globally, women control between 70 and 80% of consumer spending decisions. So considering women's needs and preferences is a significant growth opportunity for consumer facing businesses everywhere in the world, but also in the emerging markets. And so DFIs, like any investors, want their investees to be successful. And evidence suggests that gender equality can help with that. So next slide, please. So how can an investee qualify for the 2X challenge? The 2X criteria, which we see here, were developed to determine which investments are 2X eligible. So the criteria uh, proposes thresholds based on currently available data on rep women's representation in the private sector worldwide. The criteria also leave room for judgment, recognizing that each case is specific and that the criteria may need to be adapted to encourage change or acknowledge unique efforts to empower women. And so the criteria identify several ways in which transactions or investees can qualify. The first one is by promoting or supporting women's entrepreneurship. So here we're talking about women-owned businesses, which we define as having at least 51% um, women-owned shares, or 51% share of women ownership, or uh, if it's a business that is founded by a woman or women, and where this woman or women still retain an active role in the company. The second way in which in investees can qualify is by supporting or promoting women's leadership. In this case, we're talking about businesses that um, have a significant proportion of women in their senior management teams or on their board of directors or investment committee, uh, in the case of investment funds, for example. Here in the case of senior management teams, the criteria has different thresholds depending on uh, different sectors. 
So this is based on a review of currently av available data on women's representation in senior leadership worldwide, um, which really showed that there are significant um, disparities between between sectors. Um, so the 2x criteria wanted to recognize that different sectors may be uh, at different stages of their journey on women's inclusion and, and representation. So the thresholds vary between 20 and 30 uh, percent. On the right hand side you see a breakdown of, of sectors here. In the case of um, uh, you'll see that there's no uh, specific uh, sector for off-grid pay-as-you-go um, solar uh, solar energy products. Uh, however, at the moment, I would say that uh, most of the 2x challenge DFIs would classify this as a consumer goods services uh, in the consumer goods services sector. So, in the case of senior management, this would put it in the middle category at, with a threshold of 25% women in senior leadership. Uh, but however, as I, as I said, um, there is always room for judgment. So different DFIs, depending on the context, may choose to select a sector that is more appropriate to this particular, um, to this particular investee. The third criteria or the third way in which um, businesses can qualify is under the employment criteria. So by providing um, quality employment to a significant proportion of women. So the first thing I'll mention, so again, there is a um, sectoral threshold here. So the, the threshold will vary depending on the sector between 30 and 50% of the workforce. But this criteria is special because it's the only one that requires two different elements in order to secure qualification. So in addition to uh, having uh, meeting the threshold, the investee must also show evidence of a quality indicator to the employment that goes beyond compliance. So by quality indicator, we mean a policy or a program or a measure again, beyond those required for compliance, that address specific barriers to women's quality employment or to women's uh, entry, uh, retention, or uh, advancement in the workplace. So this can be addressing uh, wage discrimination or inequity, uh, lack of childcare, um, issues with discrimination, harassment, or um, lack of advancement or promotion opportunities. The fourth way in which um, businesses can qualify, so the fourth criterion is consumption. And this recognizes investees that offer products or services that specifically or disproportionately benefit women. For the purposes of the criteria, we, we consider that products and services can qualify if they are designed for women's unique needs or if they address a problem that disproportionately impacts women, have a majority of women customers, or a majority of women beneficiaries. Um, so what we are looking for in these cases is a demonstration by the investee that um, women, for in the case of a product, uh, women have been consulted uh, in, the, in the design um, of, and delivery of the product, that their um, specific needs and preferences have been taken into account, um, or that there's a, a breakdown of, of customers and beneficiaries that can be shown. Uh, so these are all things that we would look at when assessing qualification. Finally, the, the last way in which investees can qualify is the fifth criterion for indirect investments. I will not go through it in a lot of detail. I don't think it's uh, that relevant for this audience, but it uh, basically deals with um, the way we qualify on lending facilities and uh, investment funds. So an important thing to mention uh, before I wrap up about this criteria is that so full, to, in order to qualify, um, fulfilling one or several criteria makes a transaction immediately eligible for the 2x challenge. But an investee can also qualify by making a credible and resourced commitment to reach at least one of the criteria. So if the investee does not meet the criteria already, um, they can work with the DFI to make a credible and resourced and monitorable commitment uh, to reach one of the criteria which could enable them to qualify.
after qualification has been confirmed, um, the DFI expectation is that the investee will exercise best efforts to maintain at a minimum or exceed the elements of its qualification. Typically, and especially when qualification is due to a commitment made by the investee to meet one of the criteria, DFIs will require a formal written commitment, uh, which can be a side letter or a memorandum of understanding or a gender action plan with a senior level oversight uh, or a similar document that is deemed appropriate by the DFI and which should include a mix of clear targets, action items with roles and responsibilities, a resource allocation, and a monitoring system. Uh, but the practical implementation of that is up to each DFI. And I think uh, in a few moments, we'll have an example uh, from ARPITA as to how CDC uh, approaches uh, this process with, with their client. Um, once qualified, uh, the 2X investees have the opportunity to be featured on the 2X Challenge website as case studies and other reports by two, the 2X Challenge or the 2X DFIs individually. They can also use their 2X qualification for public communications and fundraising purposes um, and uh, other public facing documentation. And again, we're lucky to have a uh, peg today who can, uh, with us, who can offer their perspective on what 2X qualification has meant for them. And so before I wrap up, uh, I do want to make a quick distinction between meeting the 2X criteria and qualifying for the 2X challenge. So you might have noticed that I've talked about um, investees, not necessarily companies. Um, so this is because to qualify for the 2X challenge, um, you must be an investee of one of the participating 2X DFIs. And this is because as I've explained earlier, the 2X challenge originally started as a commitment by the DFIs to unlock more resources for women's economic empowerment and track said investments. Um, so but based on what we are um, seeing on the market, um, there is definitely a lot of traction around the 2X criteria, and we've been very, very happy to see that an increasing amount of investors and businesses are, uh, so investors are adopting the 2X criteria and businesses are benchmarking and assessing themselves against the 2X criteria, even though they're not part of the of the of the challenge. Um, so now the challenge is much bigger than the G7 and even beyond DFIs. It's with the criteria, we are seeing an emerging standard or an emerging definition for what it means to invest in women. And so it's become a tool for investors and companies looking uh, to do gender lens investing. So the tent uh, has, has gotten um, much bigger. And so we really encourage uh, investors and businesses to um, look at the 2X challenge and the 2X criteria uh, and, and join the 2X family. So I will stop now uh, and yeah, hand back over to you, Wangi. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Thank you for speaking about the 2X challenge, what it is exactly, um, introducing the 2X criteria and how companies and investors can fulfill that criteria. Um, Arpita, maybe you can tell us a little bit about CDC and how um, you assess investments uh, and how you're using the how you're using the two X criteria and what that means for you in your work. Sure, thank you, uh, Wanji. Thank you, Anne Marie. Um, so, as Wanji explained. Uh, my um, my part focuses on how CDC specifically um, assesses if uh, a potential investment qualifies for 2x, and I'll be drawing upon PEG as an example of of how we do that. Um, so CDC, as a development finance institution and a responsible investor, um, supports companies and businesses that we invest in throughout the life of our investment to help them deliver both social and impact goals. Um, gen advancing gender equality and uh, women's economic empowerment is a corporate priority for us. 
And so we um, we work closely with our companies to help them reach the the the, the benefits that out, that Anne Marie outlined previously as to why it's uh, why gender can help businesses um, both from a commercial and social perspective. And one of the key ways in which we're doing this is through the execution of the 2x challenge. So what you see on the screen here is a simplified version of our investment process at BDC. And uh, many of the other development finance institutions will follow a similar process. It starts with screening the potential investment. We then conduct due diligence on the investment. We then make the case for the investment in final investment committee before moving to working, um, before moving to monitoring and then exit. And for the purposes of today's webinar, we will be focusing on the first four stages of this diagram. So beginning with the screening process, at this stage, our deal teams, and um, what I mean by deal teams, um, we, we include here our investment officers, our environmental and social professionals, as well as our impact professionals, um, who comprise of a deal team, will conduct an initial high-level 2x assessment of the potential investee based on its specific sector. So using the 2x criteria, they would look at um, ownership, so has the investee or the company been founded by a, a woman or does do women own a majority share of the business? They would look at uh, the composition of the board, so what is the percentage of women um, that, that sit on the board of, of that company or business? They'd look at senior management, so is senior management team comprised of a, a, a good majority of women? We'd look at women in the workforce, um, and as Anne-Marie was explaining here, we would look at both the number of women in the workforce, but also assess whether they are decent, decent, um, good quality jobs within that workforce as well. And then finally, does the investee specifically target female clients um, or design products or services that are tailored to women's needs, preferences, and behaviors? If one or a combination of these uh, criteria are met by the company, we then conduct a check to see if, if the categories um, that through which they're qualifying are what we define as material to the business or the company. So this is where we, we use the criteria to assess not just the, the, the numbers um, and, and the counting of women, but to really assess whether they are being valued in, in the right places according to the activity of the business. So for example, if a company qualifies through the employment category, but it has quite a small workforce and therefore the percentage of women is quite high, but it's a small workforce. And we know that the, the most significant way in which they can advance women's uh, economic empowerment and gender equality is actually through the consumption criteria um, we would do a check to see if they could also qualify under consumption in addition to employment. So we would often, this is, uh, this is how we interpret the criteria to ensure that the thresholds in which we're qualifying them under are valuing women in the right way. In the case of PEG at screening, it was actually our environmental and social professional who flagged that they, that PEG had produced a really interesting gender action plan, um, and uh, which was supported by a Power Africa off-grid project. Um, and we saw at initial glance that it was taking a very holistic view of the entire company's operations, looking at women in leadership, women in the workforce, and engaging more female customers. So at that point, the transaction was flagged at, to our investment committee within our screening paper as having the potential to qualify under the 2X challenge. So moving along to due diligence. Once our investment, uh, our deal teams think, uh, believe that there is high potential for the, the company to qualify, that's where CDC's gender team will become more closely involved in checking the credentials of the company at this stage. 
And here we are, we're checking for, for two things. The first factor is, does the company qualify because it's an outperforming company and therefore we see it as our role as a development finance institution to qualify them and support the amplification of their work through the two, through um, through uh, qualifying them as as a two X challenge investee. The second question we ask is, does it almost qualify um, and and meet the threshold, and does the company have a commitment to qualify? And so, if if we if they are close to qualifying but not quite there, we would work with them to build up the case to qualify them post investment, and we would. And at this point, this is where we would think about providing some form of assistance um, to, to help them qualify over the lifetime of our investment. And this is what we call nudging um, as in, in the 2x language. The key documents we would ask for at due diligence include detailed gender disaggregated data across the, the activities of the business. We would ask for any uh, gender strategies or action plans that the, the company has produced, any gender or HR related policies and procedures. Uh, we would have discussions with various uh, members of, of the company to, to assess uh, both the commitment and capacity for, for them to uh, implement gender smart interventions. And we'll also conduct an analysis with respect to the 2x threshold and the local and the local benchmarks and, and local context. And this is what Anne Marie was um, uh, explaining earlier that there is flexibility within the criteria to apply room for judgment. So if we know that the company is really committed, is making really concerted efforts to advance women in any one of those criteria. Um, and is operating in a particularly diff difficult um, environment where historically women are not um, as uh, economically active, we would apply some flexibility in, in, the criteria, in, in the criteria and the thresholds and consider qualifying them um, based on um, a clear, clear commitment and clear activity. It's important to also note that TUREX qualification runs alongside many other factors and assessments that the deal teams will make during um, this due diligence um, stage. So for example, we would not qualify a company if they did not meet our standard environmental, social business and business integrity requirements as, um, as a responsible investor. And these requirements are outlined in our code of responsible investing and can be found on our website. In the case of PEG, the due diligence documents that we asked for and, and that we looked at included the uh, gender action plan that they had made for their Ghana operations. We looked at their HR-related policies and procedures, including their flexible working hours policy, paternity leave. Um, we looked at uh, analysis they had done on employee banding by gender. They'd also done some ex very interesting analysis on promotion rates across the business by gender and we also had several uh, calls with the company to understand what their commitment and what their drivers were behind uh, advancing uh, having this gender lens across their business activities um, the nature of support that um, power africa off-grid project has had given them so far um, and by those conversations we could see that there was a clear commitment and driver at, at peg um, and they had recognized the value that um, being more gender inclusive was bringing to them as a business. So moving on to final um, investment committee and uh, closing, closing the investment. If the company qualifies or is close to qualifying and agrees to work with us post investment to reach those thresholds over time, we would use this narrative to support making the case the investment case during final investment committee. Um, at this stage, we would uh, write up a 2x, um, some sort of uh, commitment, which in, in CDC's case we, is a 2x memorandum of understanding, which summarizes the thresholds in which they are qualifying under any further actions that they have committed to, as well as some reporting requirements. And this is signed before the transaction closes. 
And we also build in gender disaggregated metrics into the annual reporting requirements that, that, we, ha that we would um, have. In the case of PEG, we qualified um, the, the business on uh, three categories, uh, which were leadership, employment, and consumption. We also knew from further conversations with uh, senior management that they wanted to expand their work beyond the Ghana, uh, beyond Ghana operations to other, other geographies. And so we knew that there was a commitment to continue advancing their gender efforts. The, the MOU was signed and we announced its qualification alongside the announcement of the deal itself. We also wrote up uh, a case study and placed that on the 2X website. You can see a link to that case study um, on, on at the bottom of the slide um, here. And we um, and so moving on to monitoring, um, we are working closely with the company um, to help support the expansion of their work um, as well as um, helping them articulate the, the impact that they are gaining from um, implementation of their of their gender strategy and gender action plan. Um, so that's that's a summary of how CDC uh, assesses if an investment qualifies, um, and I will hand back to to Wanji. Thank you so much, Arpita. I think for me, uh, my key takeaway is that, uh, and the thing that makes me most uh, excited is that. Uh, while I understand that as an investor, you have many other requirements that you look for your investee companies to fulfill, I'm excited that you are looking at a gender specific lens to be included as you're making an investor case. So that's something that personally makes me very excited. Thank you, Arbiter. Um, Haley, PEG has been, spoke, has been mentioned quite a number of times and I think uh, I'll hand it over to you to speak to us about what you're doing differently, um, how gender has been, uh, how you're trying to, how you've ensured your business is as gender inclusive as it is, and what lessons you can we can learn from PEG um, as an industry that we can be able to translate into other companies. Thanks, Wangi. I um, appreciate it. Um, and thanks, our Peter, for, um, for talking to the CDC side. Um, I will um, use my time to talk a little bit more about what we did um, at PEG to address, to become more gender inclusive in our organization and also the positive business outcomes that we've seen so far. Um, so, uh, to give you a bit of context, in 2017, um, PEG Ghana had grown. Uh, quite significantly in the space of a year. We went from under 50 employees to over 150. So there was a really, really fast amount of growth that went on. Um, and we realized uh, towards kind of the start of 2017 that we had grown so, so quickly that we hadn't really looked at the, at, you know, having our leadership team as being truly representational. Um, so a lot of our leadership team was made up of males and actually the majority of our leadership was foreign born. Um, we understood actually the importance of representational leadership, um, not only for the culture of an organization, but also because there are a, there's a ton of information out there that representational and diverse leadership leads to better business outcomes. Um, so we decided to embark on a journey to, towards developing more gender inclusive business practices. Um, and so how we approach this um, is first, first of all, we started by gathering together a team. Um, we developed a partnership with an organization called EWV Canada, who was able to send us a fellow, uh, Laura Allen, to come and work with us for a year to run, the, run our gender inclusive um, gender mainstream initiative. We had a wonderful support from Karen Stevenson, who's on the call, who will um, speak very shortly, straight after me from Power Africa, who was able to support us with technical support. And, and I worked with the team to drive um, drive this change from an executive level, a leadership level. So how we started is, how, is we first of all embarked on a gender assessment. And from the results, we developed out a gender action plan. Um, which our Peter just spoke about. So the plan included a number of key initiatives, but the one I'd love to focus on today is about recruiting and retaining female talent, specifically on leadership level. Um, so we can jump to the next slide. 
so typically when we are advertising CBD leadership, very few female applicants. I had to combat this by really being very intentional around hiring and, de and developing a hiring scheme that focused on attracting more female candidates. Um, so first of all, we began um, drawing on really underutilized recruitment pipelines to increase the number of female applicants who are actually having, coming through the pipeline. So some examples of this including uh, included connecting with local female leadership groups, um, we started to go to a bunch of uh, female tech uh, groups that were located in different impact hubs. We, we connected with a whole bunch of WhatsApp groups. Um, and, and we always stated when we were talking about um, leadership roles at PEG that, that we were strongly encouraging women to apply. And we're very intentional about letting people know that that's what we were trying to do. Um, we also, for the first time, invested in a recruiter and we basically wouldn't proceed with a shortlist until qualified female candidates were in every pool for consideration. We used a similar intentional hiring scheme to also increase the likelihood of securing great local and regional talent. And I need to be very clear here um, because I definitely have a lot of questions around this. During this process, Peg Garner did not at all compromise on quality of hire. Rather, we spend more time casting a wider net to find the very, very best candidates for our leadership role. We were trying to bring more females through the pipeline at the very, very beginning to ensure that there was more females likely to, to be there at the end when we we're making decisions around who to hire. So um, a bit about the stats. So at the start of 2017, 22% of our leadership team are female. 33% were Ghanaian, um, and 18 months after our initial recognition for the need to um, diversify our representation on our leadership team, we actually doubled the number of our females in our leadership team to 44%, and more than doubled our local, local leadership numbers to 67%. Um, and during this period, we also hired our first ever uh, Ghanaian country director, who was also female, which was awesome. Um, so along with our intentional hiring strategy, we took up a number of other actions to increase representation of females uh, in our leadership team. And you can jump to the next slide for this one as well. Um, and so uh, the first thing that we started to use gender segregated data, which helped us uncover a number of problematic areas that were affecting gender equality occurring across the organization. So firstly, what we uncovered is that while entry-level female employees were frequently being promoted to middle management, they're actually getting stuck there and having difficulty progressing into senior management roles. Um, so to combat this glass ceiling effect, we implemented a mentorship program and we involved the CEO, COO, and other executive leaders to guide high-performing mid-level female managers. So not only did these high-performing mid-managers receive personalized coaching from PEG's most senior employees, but perhaps even more importantly, this provided our female middle managers with the opportunity to build strong relationships with those senior leaders who in turn would advocate for them and push them forward for more senior opportunities. Um, and to date, 25% of female participants uh, in the program have been promoted within six months of finishing up with the mentorship. Um, so again, uh, coming back to gender segregated data, uh, when we're assessing promotions, we, be we began to realize that even though men and women were being promoted equally, women were actually spending longer in a role than men before being promoted. So to tackle this and to remove the bias that was occurring, uh, the HR team actually created a standardized promotion policy that now ensures that employees are being promoted in more even time frames. Uh, during the year, we also focused on developing gender responsive policies at PEG, which are Peter touched on. So after conducting research to understand more about the barriers for women at our organization, we implemented flexible working hours to allow for employees to balance their work and private lives better. So PEG employees can now start their day as early as 7 a.m. to as late as 10 a.m. And many leadership roles have working from home flexibility. So more than three quarters of employees have now signed up, who have now signed up to the policy are actually female, which, which highlighted the need for this option for many of the women at PEG. Um, and after realizing that it was a major setback in attracting great female talent, 
PEG expanded uh, its offering of personal health insurance out into family health insurance for leadership roles because it was a benefit that was frequently being requested by potential female candidates during the recruitment stage. Uh, we also implemented a paternity leave policy, which is uncommon in the markets which we work, to encourage male employees to take time to bond with their newborns and support their wives after childbirth. And as we know, uh, diversity in leadership is not only important for representation, it's also been recognized that diverse leadership can create greater business success and sustainability, um, including things like reducing turnover, increasing innovation, and improving profitability. Um, so some of the things that we saw is that during this period, we actually had a 30% reduction in employee turnover within 18 months. Uh, we also successfully expanded into new regions within Ghana. We developed and implemented a number of creative new service delivery models, and we began piloting a bunch of new product lines. Between 2015 and 2018, Peg Ghana's revenue actually grew by 60% and even improved by a whopping 26%. So there's some great stats that, um, that, are, that have we've seen during the uh, uh, of our leadership. Um, so the conscious effort has actually resulted in really different teams as well. Uh, an example of this that I love is Peg's data and technology teams, which have 43% females and 85% local uh, employees. We, those figures are much, much higher than the industry average, and it's something that we're really proud of um, at Peg data. So for this work, as you know, Peg became CDC's first nomination for the 2X Challenge. And we also won uh, an award, the C3E Organizational Leadership Award for Gender Advancement and Energy. Um, and I want to be frank with you, we still have a long way to go, um, but we definitely see the benefits of increasing both local and female leadership in Ghana. Um, we've, we've seen significant results. And we intend to expand these good practices to our other countries of operations. Um, with the support of CDC, we're actually hiring a gender consultant to help us continue this work across the rest of our markets. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Haley. Um, I just have one quick question. I know it's not time for questions, and I know Karen wants to speak, but I was I'm very, very curious. Um, all these policies that you've put together, particularly with regards to flexible working hours, I wanted to know, can you speak about how that has impacted productivity within PEG? It's a really good question. Um, I, think, I think that it has created a more enabling environment. Specifically, I've seen it for working mothers, um, where they are able to build, um, build their time uh, with their families um, around their working hours, which means that when they're at work, they're here and they can show up and they're not worried about um, you know, needing to go home early to collect the kids or coming in a bit late um, because they've you know, needed to drop them off uh, at work, etc. which means they're at work and they're showing up more. Um, and I've just seen it definitely. We've, got, we've had a great amount of positive feedback due to that policy, specifically from working mothers at PEG. Thank you so much, Haley. I know there'll be a few more questions for you, but before our time runs out, I'd like to invite Karen to speak about the Power Africa off-grid projects. Um, why, as Power Africa, it's important to you to support companies um, that have gender equality as a priority. Um, yeah, welcome, Karen. Thanks so much, Wanji. Um, and thanks to the presenters before me. Really interesting presentations. Uh, I see that we're running on short on time. We certainly want to um, allow time for questions and discussion. So I'll, I'll be as brief, brief and quick as I can. Um, it is important I provide a brief introduction at least to the Power Africa off-grid project to frame the, the why and the how of our support and, and interest in gender equality and women's economic empowerment in the sector. As you can see from the slide in front of you that the Power Africa off-grid project provides technical assistance and targeted grant funding support to support the development of Africa's off-grid sector for improving access to energy. Um, the project is running between 2018 and 2022, 
And we um, have 25 technical advisors, uh, as you can see on the slide, specializing in off-grid solutions and technologies, market analysis, access to finance, policy and regulatory, gender, productive uses of energy, and digital finance. Um, I will leave you to read the, the outcomes your, yourselves while I move on. Um, also, just to say quickly, the project is implemented by RTI. Um, based, we're based in Pretoria, South Africa, with advisors in our focus countries. So we work through five work streams, um, business performance, access to finance, market intelligence, policy and regulatory, and cross-sectoral, which focuses on the energy agricultural nexus. Gender cuts across all of these work streams. And we aim to integrate relevant gender considerations into all our activities towards the targeted outcomes that you saw on the previous slide. This is in line with Power Africa's gender equality related objectives, which are to increase women's participation in the energy sector workforce at all levels of the value chain, and to ensure that the energy access needs of men and women are met. And you'll see those are very much in line, incidentally, with the 2x criteria. So, in other words, the objectives of the participating DFIs in the 2x challenge um, are similar and shared to those objectives, um, to Power Africa's objectives. So we recognize that when women are excluded from the workforce in decision making and as end users of energy services, Power Africa's goal to double access to electricity in Sub-Saharan Africa will not be met. So in the context of our activities under the business performance and access to work, access to finance work streams in particular, whereby the project offers targeted interventions to improve sales and business performance in the off-grid sector, as well as to help companies raise debt or equity. We also provide technical support to private sector companies, such as PEG, um, who just spoke before us, and investors to adopt gender-inclusive business practices and to apply a gender lens to investments, respectively. In other words, we integrate gender into those work, screen, work streams. So the 2X challenge and the 2X criteria have generated significant interest in this type of support. Prior to the 2X challenge, um, I can definitely speak from personal experience, it was definitely really, it was a lot more difficult to have companies buy into this type of support. Uh, many are small startups, they have competing priorities. Um, it just really uh, wasn't um, something they were interested to tackle and, and frankly, simply unmotivated. Um, so the 2X challenge has really generated um, a lot of interest and we find that really exciting as a project. So um, in, in our experience, um, many companies, however, are not familiar with the good practices um, in order to align themselves with the 2X criteria. So in other words, they're not sure how to increase women in leadership in their company. They don't know where to begin. Um, how to increase women in the workforce, how to consider the ways that their products and services can impact the lives of women in communities served while increasing, increasing their reach to women customers. Often there's not even an awareness that women may have unique needs um, from products and services that might be different than men. So the Power Africa Off-Grid project is very well positioned to provide tailored support on demand to support off-grid energy companies in our focus countries to adopt gender inclusive practices that are aligned with the criteria. The criteria has provided this really valuable framework. Haley, who just spoke, she provided one example of how this support enabled PEG in fact to align itself with the 2X criteria and qualify as CDC's first 2X investment. We're currently providing similar support to eight other companies with new requests for support frequently. So the slide in front of you illustrates the type of support we provide. Um, unfortunately, in the interest of time, I won't be able to speak in detail to, to each of the components of the support. I'm, I'm trusting you've had some time to, to read them on the slide in front of you. Um, but and you'll see that we can support a company to secure internal buy-in, particularly where there's resistance from senior leadership. We can provide tools to support a company to undertake a gender baseline assessment or a gender audit, as stated here. Um, and then, as in the case of PEG, um, which Haley and Arpita also spoke to, we use the findings from their gender assessment to support them to develop the gender action plan, whereby um, putting heads together, we identified key objectives and aligned activities, timeframes and indicators. 
Um, we share good practices and resources. We have a toolbox of good practices um, and we, we share them um, as needed. The technical assistance is provided, it's ongoing. We also document good practices. Um, we'll share a link with you after, in fact, to a, a case study that we um, developed on PEG's uh, gender inclusive measures. Um, we're also determining metrics and um, developing contributing evidence to the business case. Um, the existing business case um, doesn't necessarily speak specifically to the off-grid sector, so we're very interested in working with the companies that we're supporting to build this business case. Um, and then we also support companies to attract gender lens investors, including the DFIs that are participating under the 2x challenge. Um, I think I'll, I will stop there just in the interest of time um, to hopefully allow for, for a couple of questions from those that have logged on. Um, so thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you for being considered uh, to give us a few minutes to take some questions. Obviously, we have about four minutes. I am going to take as many questions as we can in this time frame. So, the first question is to you, Anne-Marie. Um, someone asks um, if if the if there is if the two X challenge is only for single female founders, um, or if a woman among other male co-founders would still be eligible to apply. Thanks, Wanji. Uh, yes, I did see that uh, question on the chat, and I. Uh, answered already so I don't know if all the attendees can see it but it was a very good question it was about so criterion 1b so under the entrepreneurship uh, category uh, so 1b says so it's either women-owned business or business that is founded by a woman and so the question was is it only uh, for single uh, in the case of single founders or um, what if there's there are multiple founders and one of them is a woman is it eligible um, and so my answer was so as a general rule uh, just like in the case of um, so the share of women ownership um, a majority, in the case of multiple founders, uh, a majority of women founders would be uh, required for 2x eligibility under uh, 1b. Um, but there is, of course, as both Arpitev and myself have mentioned, that there's, of course, always room for judgment. So there could be cases where uh, one uh, single woman founder among several other male co-founders could be deemed eligible depending on the, the specific context, whether the context of the business, of the sector, or of the country. Uh, but in all cases, for this particular sub-criterion, um, the woman or women founders must retain an active role in the company for the investment to be 2x eligible. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Um, Arpita, I think I'll, I'll, before we close, I think you'll answer maybe one or two questions. So the first one is, uh, it's a question with regards to the benefits of meeting the 2x criteria. Um, somebody wants to know if CDC would offer lower interest rates compared to other companies. Um, could you speak a little bit about that? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Wanji. Um, it's it's an interesting question. Um, at at this stage, um, no, we are not um, providing any cut in interest rates. So it's a, it's an interesting idea. Um, I think the the main benefits what we do do and what we are able to do is provide um, technical assistance. To, to companies if they want to advance their gender activities, um, similar to the type of support that we we are providing uh, or plan to provide with PEG. Thank you, Arpita. Um, I think there's another question still to you. Um, somebody says that their company meets a couple of criteria for uh, the two. I but they, they don't have any investment. So would it be correct to say that um, they don't have any invest, investment from a DFI? Would it be, I, I don't put words in your mouth, but maybe you can give a response to that. Um, 
Yes, sure. So, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, the, the qualification process of 2X um, really happens in parallel with a broader assessment that um, our deal teams make um, when uh, a company is seeking investment. Um, so, absolutely, it would help make make the case um, and uh, and uh, it would be part of the broad, broader broader assessment and and sort of um, process that we go through if you are seeking investment. And hi, this is Anne Marie. Maybe I can just uh, complement what uh, Arpita said. So as I've mentioned in my remarks, so there's you know businesses that there's meeting the 2x criteria and there's qualifying for the challenge so there are many businesses that maybe don't have a, a dfi investment but nevertheless meet the criteria uh, and that is that is really great so um of course if this uh, company is looking for DFI investment. It's really good to to benchmark and assess yourself against the criteria and and think about the rationale. How you would explain the rationale for for qualifications so that can really help you um, get get funding from a, or it can help you uh, market yourself to uh, to to DFIs. But even if you're not looking for DFI uh, capital, uh, it can also be uh, helpful for you to market yourself to other investors because as I've said it's it's a, a, a benchmark or a, a standard that is getting a lot of traction uh, as a definition for uh, what good investments uh, for women look like. Okay, thank you. Lastly, this question I will throw to you, Karen and Haley. Um, uh, which of you can speak a little bit about Recommended guidelines if you're thinking of developing a gender action plan. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm happy to, to address that. It's a little bit of um, a, a loaded question, not a, not a simple answer. Um, a, a really useful starting point is to undertake a gender baseline assessment. Um, there are a few existing tools um, out there that are quite user friendly, easy to use. Um, perhaps even um, any um, any Arpita or Anne Marie online also have to have one that they'd like to share with companies. But um, quickly, I could refer to the UN Women's Economic Empowerment Principles. They have a, a gender gap analysis tool um, available online. Um, if you are an off-grid energy sector company, the RCIW has um, a gender scoring tool online specifically tailored for off-grid companies. Um, there, there's various other frameworks. Um, Whoever is asking the question is welcome to, to get in touch with me uh, directly. I'm happy to share these, um, but that is a very important starting point, in fact, to developing your gender action plan. Um, it will give you a snapshot of where you are as a company in terms of gender inclusive practices. Um, you will be able to see the gaps and challenges, and those will inform your objectives. Um, so to illustrate very, very quickly um, with, with Peg, if I may, Haley, um, they did a gender baseline assessment and, and it was very clear from that baseline assessment that a key challenge, as Haley noted, was women in leadership. The, the data was, was now collected and they're right in front of them. So that informed one of the objectives and the action plan to increase women in leadership um, to 45%. And then um, we brainstormed about activities. So if one wants to increase leadership, what activities would you include in an action plan? Haley referred to the mentorship program, for example, some recruitment practices. Um, these became the activities in the action plan. And then we had corresponding um, timeframes and indicators for measurement. Um, and, and then you could have as many objectives as you think are necessary based on the findings from your uh, assessment. Um, that's a very succinct answer. Thanks, Karen. I think um, that will have to do. We are about five minutes past the hour. I want to wrap this up by saying thank you very much to you panelists. Thank you to everybody who's um, logged on to be part of this conversation. Um, as I said, very excited that these conversations are starting to happen in our space. 
Um, it only means companies will be more and more gender inclusive. Thank you very much. I hope you learned something. Uh, please feel free to send emails to any participants or go Google us stuff and we'll be happy to respond to you. Um, aside from that, I hope you have a good rest of day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.